Hello and welcome back to JNO Live. I'm Seth Truker, digital media editor at Gemin Network Open. Of course, if you're following on live, send us your questions or comments on Twitter at Gemin Network Open or in Facebook or YouTube Live in the comment box. Today, we're talking about a comparison of two triage strategy, two triage scoring guidelines, excuse me, for alloc allocation of mechanical ventilators. And we've got first author, Dr. Hannah Wunsch with us. Welcome, Dr. Wunsch. Hi, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Great. Well, this, thank you. It's really glad you could join us. This is unfortunately a really relevant and important topic for us now. Um, so first, can you introduce yourself? Tell, tell our uh, viewers who you are, what you do, and why you did the study here. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Hannah Wunsch. I'm an intensivist and professor of anesthesia and critical care at the University of Toronto. I work at uh, Sunnybrook Hospital, one of the main teaching hospitals here. Um, and I do a lot of research on uh, resource allocation, uh, use of intensive care beds. And um, this study obviously came out of uh, what was going on starting in March in terms of COVID-19. And um, I, the usual thing was we thought it would be a quick and easy study to do. Of course, it didn't turn out that way. But uh, as people were unfortunately starting to talk about uh, concern for running out of ventilators, um, we knew that out there were proposals for how to allocate ventilators in the terrible situation where uh, you know, that actually did occur. Um, and uh, it, there's certainly anecdotal evidence that, uh, that those things kind of happened on the fly a bit, um, but these triage criteria that had been proposed um, we're out there circulating as a sort of a last ditch uh, uh, approach uh, in case of emergency, but had never really been tested and looked at in any population. Um, so as a very first step, and I want to emphasize a very preliminary first step, we sort of asked the very basic question of, well, what happens if we just apply these criteria, not even to COVID patients, but just to a regular ICU population? Kind of, what does it look like? Uh, you know, who ends up in the high priority group? Who ends up in the lowest priority group? Are there differences in that are really big between the different triage criteria? And so the first step was to choose the criteria. Um, we chose the New York state criteria because those were probably the ones that were being most talked about. Um, they'd been out there actually well before any of this happened uh, back in 2015 in case of an emergency like this. And then we chose another set of criteria, which we call in this study the white and low criteria, just because they were the authors of the original paper. Um, and a caveat there that I think is important is they have since changed those criteria based on feedback um, regarding concerns from those with disabilities that perhaps the way it was framed initially was going to be potentially um, detrimental to certain groups. Um, we chose to use the, this original criteria because actually the new version was not kind of operational. Uh, we couldn't actually create groups that we could study using it. And I think that highlights a lot of the problem of trying to balance all of these. So we added these criteria to an older data set of ICU patients that's publicly available, that's made public by Philips, um, and it's called the EICU database. And it's um, patients from 2000, 2000, sorry, 2014, 2015. And we literally just tried to say, okay, let's take these criteria, take all the ICU admissions, and see how many people end up where in terms of their rankings. Um, and then also ask the question of, well, do we identify similar, the same group of patients as lowest criteria, or is it quite different? Um, so basically what we found was a relatively small percentage of patients would end up in the lowest group in terms of likelihood of receiving a ventilator if allocation needed to occur. Um, it ranged from about four to 8% between the two allocation criteria. Um, the, the, the challenge, of course, was that we didn't have perfect information on all of these people, so we kind of had to fudge a little bit in terms of some of the definitions. And then the other piece was that we did find that there was very little agreement between the two uh, allocation criteria and triage guidelines in terms of who would actually be in that lowest kind of bottom ranking in terms of receiving a ventilator. Now, those who are in this field would say, well, that's not at all surprising, because if you look at the, the triage, triage criteria, um, they're actually designed up front to potentially identify different people in terms of weighting what, you know, kind of what matters most. Um, but I think that for the rest of us, and I will put myself in that category, um, that's a little surprising. And I think needed to be sort of put out there and stated 
to say that, hey, you know, depending on how you approach this, you really do identify different people. Um, and that that's not news to the ethicists, but it is news to everybody else. So, so that's in the end why I think that this, uh, this work is important as a first step for us to just start the conversation, which unfortunately is now becoming reality again in terms of potentially needing some of these uh, guidelines in some areas. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunately really tough. And I think this is one of those situations where, first of all, none of us want to be in a situation where you have to allocate these care resources for the sickest patients. Um, which is, I, I think the, the tragic thing here is, uh, you know, the, the best, the best case scenario for these criteria is never need them. Um, and, and, you know, all the public health mitigation efforts to prevent cases and severe cases is the best thing we can do. Um, but really just looking at the figure and looking how really, you know, eight, each of the systems, uh, the triage scores allocated about 80% of patients to the highest priority. So the highest group, and they're only about, as you said, five to 8% to the lowest group. Um, that's not really helping. If you have a test that doesn't discriminate and that 80% and 5% don't really match across the two groups, it's the kappa was, I think it was 0.2, if I have that right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So very little agreement between the two. Um, and I think absolutely your point being that it, it doesn't kind of buy us a lot in terms of ventilators or ventilator days to look at this lowest group. There was a middle group, um, a kind of that intermediate group in terms of the, who, when they would be allocated ventilators. But um, again, to your point, 80%, the majority of ventilators would still be kind of going to this this high you know, uh, highest group in terms of priority. Um, and so then the question becomes, what do you do with that? Uh, our paper, of course, didn't get into that. Um, and then the other important caveat here is we weren't actually looking at COVID-19 patients. We were uh, applying this to a non-COVID population. And so maybe there'd be better discrimination uh, and kind of better allocation uh, between groups if it was COVID patients. I think that's an important next step. Um, but it, the, uh, the reality is also people come in still sick with other things. And potentially some of these patients who are non-COVID would are, will still be coming in needing ventilators. And so it is still going to be potentially applicable if this were ever to be operationalized. I think the other piece, along with learning that it doesn't identify the same patients, um, the part that I found kind of most surprising was how incredibly difficult it is just to operationalize these guidelines at all. And we were doing it retrospectively, right, with tons of time <laughs> to figure out how to put people in different groups. Um, but I can't even imagine the challenge of doing this on the fly. Um, and, uh, and also highlighted, uh, we were taking just a population, right, and applying the criteria which is a lot easier than having patients coming in at different times, um, at different sicknesses, but on different trajectories, and trying to figure out how to make sense of these guidelines. Um, it'd be interesting to do a simulation of trying to actually do this. Unfortunately, I think we're past the simulation point in some places. Um, where they're really needing to, to um, kind of wrestle with this uh, in real time. Yeah, and I think that that really resonates with with my experience with this, and and kind of what I what I was thinking about is you know I'm an ER doc and on the ground you know in Chicago during the the first big peak we were intubating about three patients a day for COVID, um, and that's an RED, which is a pretty big ED. So we got you know if we do eight hour shifts, that's already divided up among basically on average three different people who are making the decision and debate, and then you know we're big ED with I think in general, about three different zones that are going to be intubating patients. So it's we're not looking at 40,000 patients and deciding which 5% might not need to be intubated. We have one patient, or maybe I'm a crazy day, three patients who we're making these decisions for. And it's just, I think, as you said, so hard to operationalize and to make that decision on an individual patient level. Right, right. And if you think about it, if you have you know five or even three ventilators left and someone comes in who's the lowest priority, what do, you, what do you do? Do you withhold that ventilator because you anticipate there might be patients coming in who are higher priority, right? That, that I think, is the real challenge um, that we certainly did not address at all in our paper, but is um, something that will need to be addressed, unfortunately, uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think, um, and you had this a little bit about the prognostication is so difficult with COVID where it's so hard to predict uh, who's going to get sick or how long you're going to be sick for. And there were, I think, early on the reports of, you know, an average ICU or intubated stay, length of stay of something like three weeks. I think it's gotten down a bit. It's gotten a bit better 
figuring out who to debate and how to take care of patients. But I will tell you that, you know, from what I could see on the ground, the, the patients who I was seeing were sick in the ED, who progressed in intubation, who, uh, you know, did well in a few days, who did well, you know, stayed in the hospital for weeks and who got better or didn't, it was so hard to tell. And even looking through the data we had, the predictors are just really, really tough. Right. Well, and I think you raise also another important point, which is how long a patient needs a ventilator looks like it is quite different for the COVID population versus the general ICU population. So in our study, the average duration of mechanical ventilation was really just a few days. Um, And so uh, the turnover of ventilators and patients is quite a bit higher than it seems like it will be with COVID. So I think what's great is that people are really doing an, an amazing job of collecting data on COVID patients. And so going going forwards and looking backwards um, at the COVID population, we will have a lot of data to work with to really maybe try to unpack some of that and understand better what it would mean to withhold a ventilator from someone who has COVID versus non-COVID condition. Mm-hmm. And I think one other thing I wanted to discuss a little bit was, uh, and I think we've seen this now with this with this current surge, especially here in the U.S., where it's kind of the numbers are terrible, um, but it's kind of spread out nationally, and there's only a few hotspots that are that are really kind of at capacity or, or being totally overwhelmed, and like in the spring where it was very focused in certain areas, um, and it's just the it's it's very easy to talk in the abstract about are you in crisis standards or not? But when it happens, it kind of happens in a very slow march of a lot of gray areas, not one day you're doing fine, the next day everything's terrible. It's, it's uh, you know, you start making decisions like, oh, like we're out of ICU beds, so we'll hold patients ED a little longer. Well, you know, I guess we'll do a little more BiPAP than we usually do. It's not a sudden black and white switch. Absolutely. It's a sort of insidious creep um, mm-hmm. that happens and when to pull the trigger is probably not a good illusion actually but you know when when to actually declare these things um is is a real challenge i mean i think i think at at a kind of miniature level every physician and and team taking care of patients is dealing with that just in terms of when do you intubate right and then you sort of keep expanding that out to each next decision um it's the same issue of when to go into lockdown uh in different regions all of these things are so insidious and and i think it's an enormous challenge challenge. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the best thing that we can do that I've seen certainly come, looking at it from the Canadian perspective is trying to work as much as a system as possible yep. and not as these siloed hospitals that are stuck making their own triage decisions without the ability to make use of surrounding resources. Um, and I think that's something we've really learned uh, in the United States in particular, looking at how early on, uh, you know, a lot of the hospitals in New York were really sort of fighting on their own and then able to kind of come together and redistribute patients and and maybe not make these decisions for that reason um, okay. and that we really want to maximize that before we reach the point where any of these triage decisions would need to be implemented but that's a, a, a great point I think it's an incredibly hard decision well thanks and and not to uh, open up another can of worms I don't want to take too much of your time or your viewers time here but uh, but in the invited commentary Matt Winia makes a so a great point that, you know, if we're, if we're going to be making decisions based on who's likely to die or who's likely to survive or benefit from care, we've already seen all the disparities that happen, especially along racial and ethnic lines with COVID and who gets sick. Um, and we know how comorbidities are distributed uh, inequitably across this, across groups, both, uh, you know, with socioeconomic. So any sort of system that looks based on uh, prognostication is going to, in, in many ways, uh, if it doesn't intentionally not do it, is almost certainly going to reinforce uh, current uh, inequities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, a, as you say, a, a can of worms, a really important issue. Um, we did see a kind of small signal towards an increasing rates of uh, you know non-white patients in that lowest priority group. And I think you know, all we could really say is it's important that we look at this, right, and see what happens when you apply these criteria so we can start to potentially tweak them and take that into account to try to minimize the, the likelihood that we are introducing or, or enhancing and increasing those biases that are already there in terms of how care is allocated. Well, great. Again, in, in the interest of time, I think we'll stop there. Um, this really been fascinating. This really important work that uh, unfortunately is still relevant and hopefully will become less and not more so, especially the vaccines get distributed. So really appreciate the work you did for uh, your time today. So thank right. you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening and hope everyone stays safe. Great. Of course. And if you're following along, you can get this paper, the invited commentary and more at jebanetworkopen.com where everything is, of course, free to access. 
We've got new papers that are all open access coming out every weekday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And of course, join us again next week, December 22nd, on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Central Time again. So thanks a lot. Stay safe and take care. Bye-bye.